All right, welcome to this very special luncheon. Uh, as everyone knows, this is our annual awards luncheon and our, uh, we call it the hot stove luncheon. It's gonna be a very special luncheon because we have some uh, awards today and, and a very special guest. So let me introduce the head table. To my left is uh, former board member Paul Bergosian. <laughs> Next to Paul is our treasurer Frank Ferentino. <laughs> Next to Frank is our first vice president Jim Parker. And everyone's favorite sportscaster and Bo Sox MC, Dan Roach, is back with us. Danny, Danny. You always get the biggest applause. That's awesome. To our far, my far right, second vice president, Rick Lico. Next to Rick, former Bo Sox president, uh, Bruce Donahue. And our very special guest, Red Sox Hall of Famer, Baseball Hall of Famer, we're so thankful that he's here with us, Dennis Eckersley. <laughs> okay, uh, Dennis, thank you very much again for coming. This is uh, so, so great to have you here. We're gonna hear a lot from Dennis later on in the program. So as always, uh, at every luncheon, we, uh, we have military guests. Uh, this luncheon is a little bit more special because it uh, falls on Veterans Day. So I'd like to ask our three military guests to come forward and stand right here, and then I'll introduce you, and then we can, if you can hold your applause to the end of the introduction, uh, that'd be great. I'll, when I'm talking about you, I'll have you stand forward. At the conclusion of introducing our military guests, we want to recognize all veterans uh, that are in the room here today. So today, first, we have Fireman Kyle Brennan. Kyle, uh, okay. Kyle, Brennan, Kyle Brennan enlisted in the United States Navy in May of 2017, and his military specialty is gas turbine mechanic. He is currently assigned as a special events coordinator aboard the USS Constitution. He is a native of Fanwood, New Jersey, in his off time, he enjoys hiking, camping, biking, and going to various sporting events. Welcome, Kyle. <laughs> Next, we have Petty Officer First Third Class Dylan Laney. Petty Officer Laney enlisted in the United States Navy in May of 2016, and he is a culinary specialist. So that'll be, we'll have to get your uh, views on the lunch today. Uh, <laughs> On board the USS Constitution, his assignment is Galley Watch Captain. Petty Officer Laney has received the Navy and Marine Achievement Medal. He is a native of Alliance, Nebraska, and his favorite sport is baseball. All right. <laughs> and then we have Petty Officer Third Class Angela Karekia. Petty Officer Karekia enlisted in the United States Navy in May of 2016 and her military specialty is medical representative. On board the USS Constitution, she is a member of the tour board team. Petty Officer Correcter is a native of San, Clement San Clemente, California, and she has been involved in martial arts for 10 years, including seven years as an instructor, so do not mess with her. <laughs> thank you to each of you for being here today, and thank you for your service to our country. Okay, Paul, do they know where they're sitting? Yep. And at this time, as you just settle down in, thank you very much for that, uh, very, very special. Uh, we'd like to recognize any veterans that we have here in the room. So if you're a veteran, you're currently serving or formerly served in any of the military, would you please stand up? Please stand up, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for your service, thank you very, very much. Okay. Uh, as all of you know, we have military that, that come to every luncheon, and those military are guests, uh, the benefactor of a very special friend of the Bosos Club, 
uh, and he, I believe, is here with us today. Is Mike in the room? Mike Azenstein? Mike, would you please stand up? Mike, for several years, has uh, covered the cost of the military luncheons. And uh, Mike, I can't tell you how much that means to all of us here in the club. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We really appreciate that. So as I mentioned, today is uh, special because we're giving out two of the most prestigious awards that the Bosauce Club has. Uh, one of those awards uh, is the Bill Brooks Award. And, and right now I'm going to be calling up, uh, Frank, are you coming up first? I'm going to call, hand the mic over to Frank Ferrantino to talk about the Bill Brooks Award. Good, Good afternoon, everybody. For some of you who are newer members here, um, this award is given in memory of my good friend for the past many years, Bill Brooks. And uh, this is the third award that's being presented in, uh, in the honor of Bill Brooks. The two previous winners were Dick Bresciani, Vice President of Public Relations for the Red Sox and their historian, and our poet laureate, Dick Flavin. So today we're gonna make a third award. If you have a look at the screen, you'll see Bill in his days with the Bow Sox. So I just want to make a few comments uh, regarding Bill. There are only a few people in one's life who affect you deeply. If you are fortunate to be blessed in marriage, of course, your wife is always number one. She is your soulmate, your helpmate, and the person that you most uh, <coughs> enabled by. When we develop our best friends through our school years, perhaps on the ball fields, college, and later on in business life. For those of us who played baseball or have followed the Red Sox for decades, attending the Bow Sox luncheons is always a highlight in our social schedule. Some of my best associations and friendships came through the Bow Sox Club. Thus, I was thrilled to be asked to join the club in the mid-90s and became treasurer in 1999 the same year that Bill Brooks became president of the club. For many years on the board, I soon developed an up close and personal view of Bill Brooks and the effect he had on other board members. His can-do attitude was the driving force behind many an outstanding Bow Sox project, which he always oversaw from start to finish, with his attentive eye on details and achieving perfection. His quiet confidence in problematic times had a calming effect on his fellow board members and his positive spirits and good humor always proved to be downright infectious. Bill always made sure he was accessible to the Bow Sox Club members and always responded to their requests with patience and diligence. Bill's friendly attitude never failed to set people at ease. I always admired Bill's approach to people. Both Bill and I appreciated the movies of John Wayne, perhaps because Bill lived by one of John Wayne's great lines. Words are what men live by, what they say and what they mean. Bill was always a man of his word. He looked you in the eye, had a firm handshake, and always spoke the truth. Bill was a true fan of the Boston Red Sox through thick and thin. In his years, he saw a lot more hardship and disappointment than glory and winning. Inevitably, each spring, Bill would take the lead and spearhead the Bow Sox effort or organizing all the myriad of details for spring training, specifically coordinating all the tickets for Bow Sox members who wanted to attend. I recall vividly on many occasions seeing Bill, and this is true, with hundreds of tickets on his bed, sorting them out, organizing them by game and specific individuals, and then having them delivered, often by himself personally to each Bow Sox member. This was as true in Winter Haven as it was in Fort Myers. Bill was the go-to guy when you needed something done for spring training. Bill was never happier than when he was in the company of Ted Williams, his hero, as he is for all of us fortunate enough to grow up in the days when Ted was Teddy Ballgame and ruled the town. So in 1999 and in 2000, when Bill was president of the club, and was able to arrange special visits and luncheons in Citrus Hills at the Ted Williams Hall of Fame. And busloads of Bow Sox members were able to share in those visits and be in Ted's presence for hours at a time. Bill was never happier. He loved to see how his hero was so appreciated and respected 
by his Bow Sox Club friends. And it was only through Bill's initiative and his relationship with Ted that these visits occurred. Was instrumental in the Bow Sox Club and placed a plaque at the Ted Williams Museum in the name of the Bow Sox. It was Bill who took one of Ted's illustrious teammates, and I think some of you know who this man is, Johnny Pesky, to doctors when Johnny was in failing health. Bill would drive from Westwood, his home, to Lynn to pick up Johnny and make sure that his doctor's appointments were fulfilled. And I also can remember another incident when Craig McNutt, president, former president of our club, knew of an 11-year-old boy who had cancer, and he asked Bill if he would be able to contact the Red Sox front office and arrange for his boy to meet Nomar in 2000. Bill got in contact with Bresch, who arranged for the boy to meet with Nomar in spring training. This began a relationship between Bill and the boy and Nomar. Bill arranged for Nomar to further spend time with the boy in the clubhouse in the dugout and provided the boy with a lot of Red Sox merchandise. Later in that season, Bill and I arranged seats behind third base dugout for this son and the father and provided the young boy with refreshments through the game and again provided the opportunity to boy to spend time with his hero, Nomar. The father later said to Bill, my son was never eaten as much as he has today. This time spent with Nomar revived my son's spirits and I believe kept him alive for a longer period of time. This boy died in November of 2000. This was the type of activity that Bill always did when asked to perform a charitable act. Bill was always the go-to guy if you needed a favor done and was always willing to call anyone to have a favor performed. Bill was truly a man with a heart of gold. In addition, for over 15 years, Bill and Gene Brooks ran the merchandise table at the Bow Sox luncheons and events, and in doing so, generated tens of thousands of dollars for our charities. These are just a few of the good deeds Bill did for the Bow Sox Club. Bill's generosity of spirit, his always helpful manner, his altruism, and his leadership skills are not only qualities that, this, that his Bow Sox friends admired, but also virtues that they tried to emulate through their own behavior and actions and commitment to the club. Bill was my dear, dear friend who I loved and will always miss. I would like to now introduce Bill's son, Bill Brooks. <laughs> now for today's presentation of the Bill Brooks Good Guy Award, I present to you a long time member of the Bow Sox Club and, cl and board member, Paul Bogosian. Thank you, Frank. All of us have our entry points into the life of Bill Brooks. Many of you here must have known him. Uh, in the conversations I've had with you in past years, you all have your anecdotes. Uh, I want to share one with you today. It was sort of an unusual encounter, my first meeting with Bill, and it goes back to the early 90s. I had a, uh, a quasi-business relationship with Lou Gorman. At the time, I was president of a lecture agency here in town, and occasionally uh, various church groups or social groups would want to bring in Lou Gorman as a speaker. So I would get in contact with him, and he always was very generous of his time, uh, he was really a great man and a great patriot and a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Navy, by the way. And uh, so I was scheduled to talk with Lou at this particular lunch at Pier 4. Some of you may remember that all of our luncheons were at Pier 4 in the 80s and 90s at this point. And Lou was scheduled to be the feature speaker at this particular lunch, and I had made arrangements to meet with him afterwards to discuss the details of this uh, public appearance that I wanted him to make. And uh, I got a call about, oh, 10 o'clock that morning. And it was from Kevin Kelly. Some of you might remember that Kevin Kelly was the theater critic of the Boston Globe. And he had just had a breakfast meeting with June Allison, the actress. And June was in town to discuss a specific part that she wanted to play in a play and thought that Kevin Kelly could be of help. And uh, she said, uh, you know, she said, I'm also interested in making some public appearances and generating some honorarium, et cetera. 
So Kevin Kelly gave me a call about oh, 10, 10.30 in the morning. This was the morning I was going to meet with Lou Gorman for lunch at the Pier 4. And uh, he said, you know, June Allison's in town, really would like to meet with you. It would be a great opportunity. She's a lot of fun. And uh, if you could do it. So I said, well, uh, yeah, sure, let's do it. So he said, well, he said, I can't spend the lunchtime with you. He said, would you mind picking her up at the Ritz Hotel, which is now the new Taj Hotel, which was called the Ritz in those days. So I picked her up and I said, Miss Allison, I said, it's a great pleasure, et cetera, et cetera. I said, but you know, th to be very frank, I'm in an awkward situation. I'm scheduled to meet with the general manager of the Boston Red Sox, Lou Gorman, at this lunch. And she said, where it's going to be? And I said, it's going to be on the waterfront, Pier 4. She says, I love Pier 4. I love seafood. Can I come along with you? And I says, well, that would be great. So in those days, if you went into Pier 4, you might recall there was the coat room on the right, and the tickets for the Bosox lunch would be right there. And then you'd, you'd get your ticket, and you'd go up the stairs, and that's where you would have your lunch. And uh, so I went in there, and she said, uh, can I powder my nose? I said, sure, why don't you powder your nose? And she says, I'll get the, the tickets, and we'll go right upstairs, and we'll have lunch, et cetera. And uh, so she came out, and I had the two tickets. And she said, are the seats good? And I said, well, I said, you know, it's, it's a lunch and a restaurant, and we'll, we're going to do the best we can. And she called over this uh, man in a red jacket. And in those days, the officers and directors of the Bosox Club all had red jackets. And to her, as a Hollywood figure, she thought they were ushers. <laughs> so she calls over this, uh, this man, and uh, he's very cordial. And I said, uh, uh, sir, I said, uh, this is uh, uh, June Allison, and she's having lunch with us. And I says, oh, Miss Allison, you know, very excited to meet with you. He said, uh, let me uh, uh, help you. So she gives him the ticket <laughs> to go upstairs for the lunch. And in those days, you had to walk up the stairs. And she was getting up in her years. As, uh, as Lou told me later, she still had her curves but lost some of her fastball. <laughs> but in any case, they're walking up the stairs, and uh, uh, he goes up to, he goes upstairs and uh, he says, well, he says, just follow me and we'll get you a, uh, a good seat. She says to me, you know, she said, this usher is very, very nice to me. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, he knows that you're a star, Miss Allison. So uh, he comes up and he said, uh, please, he said, by the way, he said, my name is Bill Brooks and I'm on the board of the Bosox Club. And I said, well, you know, very nice. That was the first time I met Bill Brooks. And he said, but uh, he said, I want to introduce you to somebody else. And he said, this, this man can be a big help to you because he's connected with the Red Sox. And uh, he might be able to do something special for you while you're at this lunch. So he takes us over and we meet this, this, this shorter man losing his hair and uh, very, very cordial, but very involved with all the details of the lunch. And of course, that was Dick Bresciani. So uh, Lou is now seeing us on the dais and starts waving. And she says, oh, look, that man up in the dais recognizes me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she said, uh, I'd like to go up and talk with him, and maybe he wants my autograph. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, you know, the lunch is going to be starting soon. I think we ought to get a table. So Bresh picks up the cue right away, goes up to Lou Gorman. And Lou Gorman sort of makes room, and they bring up another chair, and June Allison is sitting next to Lou Gorman, and Lou was thrilled, right? <laughs> Lou was thrilled. So in that one anecdote, I met Bill Brooks for the first time. I met, really, Dick Bresciani for the first time. And the lunch was just fabulous. And then there was a third person who I also met that day, uh, but I, and that was Dick Flavin. And uh, I introduced Dick to June Allison. And uh, they started talking about theater and show business and what have you. And then in those days, the gentleman who headed up Pier 4 was Anthony Anastas. And he loved to get his picture taken with everybody. So uh, at the end of the lunch, we came down, and Anthony has his picture with June Allison and holding her and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and I said, well, that, that was just great. And then we just continued on with our lunch, talked with Lou, et cetera. And that was the first time I met with them. So about. Um, Two years later, Dick and I are having lunch, a uh, Christmas lunch, at Pier 4. And Dick said, uh, you know, he says, I think I have a photograph of myself here. So we go looking around and looking around, and finally we find, in the right-hand corner, a picture of Dick Flavin with Anthony. 
and who's next to Dick Flavin but June Allison. <laughs> so that tied it together. But in any case, that was my anecdote, and that's how I met all of these people for the first time. Now, let's get on to the Bill Brooks Award, why we're here. Our third recipient, okay, we had Dick Bresciani, we had Dick Flavin, this is our third recipient. This is not an award that we give um, easily. It's not an award that we give every year. The person who receives this award, award has done notable, notable, exceptional events on behalf of the Bo Sox Club. Now this recipient, our third recipient, none have been so tall or demonstrated such consistent strength in furthering the noble objectives of the Bo Sox Club as this year's recipient of the Bill Brooks Good Guy Award. Now to the wording of the award. Bo Sox Club, Bill Brooks Good Guy Award 2017. President, 1999-2000. Board member, 1990-2002. Club member, 1969-2013. Bill Brooks passed in March 2014. Bill was a man of demonstrable honesty, integrity, dignity, candor, and good humor. Through his years of service to the Bo Sox Club, Bill could always be counted on to take the proper initiative and lead his team of fellow board members with clarity, grace, and even temperament that allowed him to listen to all points of view with respect and a caring understanding. Bill always conducted his Bo Sox Club affairs as a gentleman with what in an earlier era would be considered class. In appreciation of Bill Brooks's many contributions to the club and his inspiring commitment to the charitable functions of the Bo Sox Club, the Bill Brooks Good Guy Award recognizes this year a 50-year club member of the Bo Sox Club, a man of true grit and relentless integrity who always seeks to do the right thing and not the easy thing. A man who stepped forward a decade ago, decade ago when the Bo Sox Club needed a re reconciler and a patent-like leader to move the club forward to a brighter day. Our 2017 Bill Brooks Good Guy Award recipient is an American patriot having served eight years in the U.S. Navy. He is a one-of-a-kind man for all Red Sox seasons and a goodwill ambassador for all things Bo Sox. He is not a man content with hitting dribblers through the infield, but is the clutch hitter you want at bat swinging for the fences when it means the most for the Bo Sox club. For his consistent and exceptional devotion to the Bo Sox club, his innumerable and immeasurable contributions to the Bo Sox Club. As past president, as a director for decades, and as a member of the club since 1967, this year's Good Guy Award winner is Bruce Donahue. This was one of the greatest conspiracies in Bo Sox Club history. <laughs> he had no idea. Let me give you some specifics. Bruce's notable exploits on behalf of the Bo Sox Club include the following. The 2012 Ted Williams stamp that was the result of Bruce's multi-year effort coordinating between the Boston Red Sox, the United States Postal Service, and the Williams family. Memorabilia Gatekeeper. Bruce's purchasing, collecting signatures, and inventorying items such as baseballs, bats, hats to be used at club raffles have literally raised tens of thousands of dollars 
on behalf of the Bow Sox Club, most of which have gone to the Red Sox Foundation. Bruce's management of the annual spring training tickets is a multifold, time-consuming task that he has handled on behalf of the club for many, many years. Bruce's instrumental role and his liaison relationship with Red Sox management have contributed mightily in organizing special guests and players at Bow Sox Club luncheons. Bruce took the early lead in organizing the military service members to be honored at Bow Sox Club luncheons and initiated the relationship with sponsors to cover the cost of military personnel to attend the luncheons. As Goodwill Ambassador for the Bow Sox Club, Bruce has acted for decades as liaison with the Cape Cod League, the Pawtucket Red Sox, the Jimmy Fund, and Red Sox Management. And he helped establish the Bow Sox Club plaque at the Fenway Park entrance, as well as chairing the St. Anselm's Scholarship Committee on behalf of the DiMaggio family and the Bow Sox Club. Bruce's character and personality always enlightens his fellow Bow Sox Club directors and members with this optimistic expression, quote, there's always another spring coming along, another summer afternoon and evening at Fenway, and another time at bat that gives us another chance to get the big hit. With warm gratitude and great appreciation, the Bow Sox Club proudly presents the Bill Brooks Good Guy Award to our friend, Bruce Donahue. That's not good. That's not it. That's him. Really? Yeah. I don't think so. This is a little award. He says this is Pam's. <laughs> no. Here we go. This is the Bow Sox Club. Bill Brooks Good Guy Award 2017, Bruce Donahue. Thank you. Now for years, for years, Bruce has been getting this for other honorees of the club. So keeping this uh, award hidden and not letting him know about it uh, is part, all part of the conspiracy. So. <laughs> we get some nice photos. Yeah, let's go over here. No, it's all right. Bill, move it. Break. Okay. 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 Bruce, get a couple of Um, I got the peanut gallery here. Um, I'm not one for a lack of words. I guess today I'm a lack of words. Given the fact that Eck is in the house and he's most appreciative that he came, I think I'd like to be like Bill Mazeroski at the induction ceremonies. Bill said like four words and got off, so I don't want to take too many more. All my grandchildren are here. All of my children are here. I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I'm very much appreciative, and I love being part of the Bosox Club. Thank you. As you can see, we have a lot of photos of Bill I mean, a Bruce um, on the screen. And I want to thank Tom Stapleton from Wakefield Cable Access Television, who's photoing all of this, and his son and his, his associate, Ryan. So thank you both for doing this and putting this all together for us. Um, this was all provided by Bruce's family, and we put it together so that you can enjoy this for the next few minutes uh, of the luncheon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Frank and Paul. As I mentioned, we have two ex distinguished awards, and there's no way I can get us back on track here. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do want to give this next award is an uh, award that is given out every year. It's the Jernigan Award. It's uh, one of our most prestigious awards, along with the um, Bill Brooks Award. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Jernigan Award. The Jernigan Award is named in honor of the late Brad Jernigan, 
a charter member and president of the Bosox Club in 1969 and 70. His dedication and tireless efforts on behalf of the Bosox Club remain an inspiration to all that follow. His enthusiasm during the founding of the club and his leadership during the formative years were indispensable to the ultimate success of the club. The award, presented by a vote of the Board of Directors, recognizes special and continuing contributions to the Bosox Club. The award is presented at the annual meeting of the Bosox Club in the years in which the Board of Directors believes there is a fitting and deserving candidate. Past recipients of the, Bos of the Jernigan Award our last year was Larry Lacchino. We have Dan Roach to my left, who was also a recipient. John Harrington, Buddy LaRue, Haywood Sullivan, Johnny Pesky, Bruce Donahue, and the list goes on and on. Uh, we are very pleased this year to say that we have a recipient, and the Bosauce Club Board of Directors got together and it was a unanimous vote. And uh, this year's recipient that we'd like to call up to the podium right now is Pam Ken. So Pam, we surprised you as well. <laughs> All right. The children are welcome to come up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we pulled it off, Sherry. I think we pulled it off. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Stand right here if you would. I'm going to say a few words about Pam. We're honored to have Pam's family here with us today. And uh, I think someone said this has been a conspiracy to try to keep it secret from Bruce and secret from Pam has been, uh, has been a, a true task. And then, and then when Pam sent me a note that said that you couldn't make the, the board meeting because your children were at home, I was like, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me say a few words about Pam. I think everyone knows Pam, but Pam Ken was named vice president of the Community Alumni and Player Relations for the Boston Red Sox in November of 2015. Prior to her promotion, Pam served three seasons as Senior Director of Public Affairs with oversight of community player and alumni relations, as well as the area of publications, photography, and archives. From November 2008 until January 2013, Pam was the club's Director of Media Relations. During that time, she was a day-to-day -day baseball public relations contact and traveled with the team throughout spring training, the regular season, and postseason. Pam began her Red Sox career as an intern working for Dick Bresciani in June of 2000 and received her BS in sports management from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in 2001. In 2012, she was presented with the inaugural Alumni on the Rise Award presented by the Mark H. McCormick Department of the Sports Management to those who have demonstrated exceptional achievement in the sports industry while also giving back to programs with their time and resources. Pam has served on the Board of Directors for the Bosauce Club as a representative for the last three years, although she covered several board meetings for Dick Bresciani when he couldn't be here over the last 17 years. So Pam has been a dear friend of the Bosauce Club for the last 17 years. And Pam and her staff have been a tremendous part of the success of the Bosauce Club, and we are truly appreciative of her dedication and her liaison between the Red Sox and the Bosauce Club. Pam's husband, Ken, is here, and they have five children, Amanda, Drew, Nick, Holly, and Ryan. It is our honor to present you with the esteemed Jernigan Award. picking up my Mother of the Year trophy right after this. Oh, hey. <laughs> Frank, you picking up this tab today? Oh, very nice. 
Um, thank you so much. I can't believe everyone is here. This is an amazing honor, and um, it wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Dick Bershani and Lou Gorman. So thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Very special indeed, and uh, thank you all for your patience. Uh, as, we, as we noted that the lunch has been delayed a little bit because we wanted to give everyone a chance to, to really recognize our two special award recipients today. So congratulations, Bruce, and congratulations, Pam, two people that make the Bosauce Club run. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Okay, let's move forward with our program. Hi. Okay, uh, I thought, by the way, June Allison was this year's award winner of the <coughs> award, right? The way that story was going, I was like, it's going to be June. Uh, yes, she's, yeah, she'll be walking in at any minute. Yes, and uh, again, I don't think it was strong enough, the words you used. Again, if we could all have a round of applause and pray and say thanks, uh, give a great word of thanks, the fact that Dr. Charles Steinberg is not speaking today here at the Bosox Club luncheon. Yeah, a little louder than that, please, so we can hear it in Pawtucket. Charles is right now walking the streets of Rhode Island saying, please, here, Nichols, Times, are looking for anything to build that wonderful ballpark on the uh, ocean, so that is nice. Uh, and again, not strong enough. Uh, I don't care if you ever watch Channel 4. When you are, are this close to falling asleep, just please put it on your cable system because it may help pay my salary going forward. So please do that. It's all about ratings. So thank you. Uh, welcome. Happy Veterans Day. And thanks again to the wonderful people from the U.S. Constitution that are here. Uh, and I, we had a chance to see that. When was the Red Sox tour with the Constitution the, in the trolley with David Ross and those guys? That was maybe when they arrived in 13. That was a lot of fun as well. So uh, it's a great take. Uh, it was about eight below zero when we went on that little tour, but it was fun, uh, much as it is today. Uh, congratulations to our St. Anselm's baseball and softball players, John and Megan. Uh, John, you played for Coach Barry Rosen, who was a good friend of mine, yes, up in Andover. And uh, Megan, you play for Jill Gagnon, who's a wonderful lady as well. You play with Aaron Thompson, who's on that team too, and Maddie Borelli, so sell, tell them I said hi. Uh, my daughter is a softball player at uh, Babson, yeah, who you just lost to this fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. one nothing. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait. Their two best players, my daughter and uh, Ashley Tango, were playing field hockey that day, so they didn't even take part in that scrimmage, one nothing. Yeah. But congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> it's always fun, isn't it? <laughs> yes. All right, so let's get right to it. Uh, here's a man. And can we start off with a, a boo, just a quick boo for Dennis Eckersley, and I'll tell you why. We're walking in, coming up the, uh, the walkway to come into this place, and I'm like, man, it's cold and everything else. And next comes, you know, the, you know how Eck is, walking with the swag and everything else as he gets out of his car, and he's like, hey, I'm going to Florida tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. So let's bring him up. Uh, I was there at the induction ceremony. We all know. Let's bring up the great Dennis Eckersley right now. All right, Eck, so uh, let's begin with, I, I guess, I mean, you take us where you want to go here. You did the postseason. Uh, how much fun was that, and how much fun was it to watch the Astros and you know, the, the Dodgers go at it. That was a great series. Let's begin with that. Just your thoughts on the way the baseball season ended. Well, I, I, I'm excited for Houston. You know, I, the Dodgers, I was a giant fan when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, I ended up having to do the Dodgers against the uh, uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks. And uh, not that I was rooting against the Dodgers, but they ended up winning. And uh, I just think it was a great World Series more than anything else, just being a fan, watching the game. Uh, you know, having watching Houston, the, the problem was the Red Sox not getting any farther. You know, I, I mean, that's shocking the last couple of years how it's ended for the Red Sox. You, know, you win, and then Farrell's gone. I mean, everything is just, uh, they're going in a different direction. I'm more concerned, not so much what happened with the World Series, it's what's going on with the Red Sox going farther. And uh, my take on the whole thing is it's going to be interesting to see how the players take to, you know, to Alex Cora. Um, 
it's the same team. I, obviously, everybody knows we need a bat. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's what's going to happen. I don't know what they're, you know, if they're going to pay for it. I, I can't imagine them giving up a lot of young players to get like a Stanton. I don't think that's going to happen. But the, the, the team is there. They're as good as anybody. I, I'm afraid of the Yankees, to be honest with you. The way the Who Yankees, isn't? Yeah, the way the Yankees played in the playoffs. I'm concerned about the Yankees. I mean, they've, they've got some young players, too. And uh, so this is not going to be easy this year. I mean, we've got, uh, pitching-wise, we have, you know, I think the best staff, you know, especially with Price coming back, pitching the whole season. I mean, they're as good as anybody. And so I don't see, and then you got to worry about second base. You know, as Pedroia is not going to come back till June, so what are they going to do there? But you got to like this team. you got to like this team, especially with Devers at third base. He's ca who knows what he's capable of doing. So I'm excited about, you know, I'm excited about the season next year. I just, uh, I just hope they make a move. All right, thanks, Zach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's go back, try to circle back here a little bit. Um, to me, one of the things that maybe we lost sight of or, or didn't see was uh, I remember Brian Butterfield saying the, the year that Tori Lovello was interim for John while he w underwent cancer treatment, uh, he said that when the players came back to spring training, every day in September, August and September, they couldn't wait to come to the ballpark. Couldn't wait for the joy of, of just going out there and playing and talking the game and everything else. And then when they came to spring training, they couldn't wait for it again. I feel like the, the joy of, of playing every day in Boston has maybe dampened their spirits a little bit. And maybe a guy like Alex Cora, who you see he just oozes love, passion, enthusiasm for the game, uh, maybe that's an advantage. And then they surround him with a lot of good people like Ron Renneke, but also Pedro Martinez, David Ortiz, all there to, to be a, an ear and an eye for him. How difficult a challenge is it going to be for Alex Cora with that group? Well, what I saw from Alex during the press conference was uh, I saw confidence. You know, I saw confidence. And then this, this comes down to, especially you're watching around major leagues about firing, you know, getting rid of, uh, of um, you know, managers, whether it's Girardi or Farrell, what have you. I mean, this game's going young, managers-wise, and I think he brings that energy. You know, I think that's exactly what this club needed. And uh, because, you know, this is a different breed of players. You know, it just is, this, these younger players. And you've got to be able to relate to these players. You just do. Uh, you know, not that they're not motivated, but, you know, playing in, in, in Boston is difficult. And you got to sort of shut it down. You can't listen to all the noise because it'll get you. I mean, I wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't easy for me either. But I think it's worse than when I played. And so it's very difficult. And I think that uh, Alex has got a chance with a whole new pro coaching staff. Not that uh, I think that was all the, the greatest idea. You talk about uh, Butterfield was a great coach. I mean, sorry to see him go, but you know the nature of the business. You got Tony Larusa though now, which right. is a beautiful thing. I, me and Tony go back so many years, so I'm looking forward to, to having a second connection with him. Not that that's going to do anything for no, me. No, but that'll help. What does what does he bring uh, that maybe we've never seen? Because you you played for him and you've known him for years. What will he bring as far as just kind of be able to be eyes and ears for this team and, and for Alex and company? Well, look at the, what he's done. I mean, you're talking about 50 years in the game. How can you not, uh, you know, take the resources that he has and, and uh, bounce it around? I mean, especially for Alex Cora or, or whatever. I mean, anytime you've had anybody with that kind of success over the course of that time, it's got to be a plus for the Red Sox. And uh, so I'm not concerned about that. I just, you know, the, 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 the team is there. I mean, the core is there. We've got to love these young players, you know, and, and guys are going to come back and have maybe better years. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough business, it's, you know, from one year to the next, but I'm excited. What did you like about this? What do you like about this young core? Well, how can you not? Look at the outfield, you know. I mean, you talk about probably one of the best young outfields in the game. And I'm thinking that uh, Bogarts at short is going to be a better player. You know, he, after the second half, he was brutal. And it had a lot to do with his, an, you know, his hand being hurt and what have you. But uh, I see him being better. And I said to the Devers at third, you know, who knows what he's capable of doing. Good behind the plate, two good catchers or whatever. How are they going to go there? But uh, I don't know. I'm excited. I, I really am. Porcello's going to be better, you would assume, right? Pomerantz had a great year. And Price is going to be there all year. Plus sale. And yeah, plus sale. And how about, who's the guy that uh, Carson Smith's back? 
for the whole season, right? Who's the dude we lost for? Tyler, Tyler Thornburg, you get him back. Right. So, you know, the, the, if you're thinking about stretching it in the bullpen, you got the best closer in the game. So, I mean, it's a good club. Well, certainly uh, the other part of it is they missed David Ortiz. You talked about energy. They talked, you know, David was the kind of guy he could handle everything. He could handle clubhouse issues, but he also could handle, hey, Jackie Bradley Jr., you need to do this, 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 and this. You know, just kind of looking at his swing and everything else. Yeah. So maybe they bring some character guys in here. Uh, and, and even a guy like David Price, we all know the story, w what happened with you. Yeah. How, how, do, how would you handle that in that clubhouse if you were Alex Cora going forward? He said day one that he, he's met with him, uh, he spoke with him on the phone already, he plans to meet with him down there. What, would you, what advice would you give Alex when it comes to trying to handle some of these guys and maybe getting that clubhouse? Because you know chemistry is a huge thing, especially here in Boston, because they need it. Yeah, I, I think that's what they were missing. You know, um, I, I think, first of all, it's difficult for a pitcher to be a leader. I, I, you know, this guy's pitching every five days. It's, you could cheer all you want in there. You need a veteran, everyday player that grinds it out. And, and they didn't really have that. You know, and I think you can bring around all the guys you want in the world, but you've got to create some sort of guy that's going to take over and be that. Now, I don't know where you're going to go veteran-wise. Yep. That's why when they put that team together in 2013, it was incredible how many, t how many hits they made on some of the guys they yep. brought in. It was just, that just doesn't happen. And I can't think right now, because I'm not, I'm not, my nose is not in that clubhouse and getting the, you know, getting the temperature of what's going on in there. I think it was an unfortunate accident, <laughs> unfortunate circumstance with David Price and all that. You know, there's a very temperamental guy, you know, very smart guy, but I don't think he handled that very well at all. You know, it should have been a one-on-one -on -one situation. But then th that had a life of its own, you know. And uh, you think about it, they won in spite of all that, you know. And the, and the Petey thing at the start of the year with Machado, that, that wasn't pretty either. So, you know, just because you're playing 10, 15 years with the Red Sox, it's like Pajora. I don't think he really wants to be a leader necessarily. No, you know? he's just a guy who wants to show up and play. Yeah, and he plays hard, and that's yeah. how he and is. And you a follow leader. him. It's yeah. like Tech used to be. Tech right. was that quiet leader. He was so busy preparing right. all the time, getting things ready. He just kind of say, follow me. But you have the Millars and the Damons of the world to handle the media and handle all those issues outside, too. But, you know, the, you know, you have a guy like David Price. He has a lot of following. You know, you've got a lot of, you know, kids that follow along. So, you know, that's the job that and you can't get around it. I mean, Cora's got to go in there and, and, you know, and you need these guys. This guy is going to be your ace, one of your aces. So, I mean, that's probably one of the most difficult parts of this job. We never would have talked about it years before, would we? No. You know, not at all. But all of a sudden, I mean, that's a big deal. And I, you know, that's not an easy job. You know, I mean, I don't know. I well, it, it, it wasn't easy on you. The whole David Price. I give you a lot of credit for what you were able to do and how you handled that situation because it couldn't have been easy for you. No, it was bad. It was awful. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I don't want the attention to begin with, let alone that, you know. But at the same time, it's just, I don't know, it's just not right. And the, the fact of the matter is, this is a diff different breed <laughs> of kids. You know, we can sit around and talk about millennials all you want, but this is, they're different, you know. And, uh, well, and the, it's different for me from watching is, you know, I've always had a ball player come up and say to me, hey, I don't care what you say about what I do on the field, just don't get into my personal life, don't rip me as a person, and then I'll have right. a problem with you. That's not the case anymore, is that if they're sensitive to everything when it comes to performance, and it, it gets in their head, which has changed. Well, the, the fact that what I do, you know, when I'm doing the games, is I'm just calling it like I see it. And you try to be as honest as you can be, and... Uh, Sometimes I think those players want their mom and dad to be doing the game. <laughs> you know? But I've got to keep doing what I do because, if, you know, if you get, that's why I don't get real close with the players. I mean, you know your job. I mean, you have to sort of have a relationship with them because you need them. You know, as far as I'm concerned, if I, if, you know, I don't want, I want to be objective. I just do, and if you get too close to players, you'll find yourself, you know, whoa, whoa, not knowing where to go, and I, that, that's why I feel free as a bird. Uh, I was just looking at my phone earlier, so Nesson announced that uh, Mr. Price's dad will be in the booth with you starting <laughs> next season. <laughs> <laughs> really looking forward to that, right? <laughs> not, not Jerry, <laughs> Mr. Price. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, some final thoughts here. Uh, I find it interesting, uh, the passion you've had for the game, the passion that we've seen from the guys that have won championships here, 
You look at the 04 team, the 07 team, and now we're seeing a guy like Dave Roberts. We're seeing a guy like Alex Cora. We're seeing guys from those particular teams that are now managers in the game of baseball and first-time managers like a Dave Roberts. Just your thoughts on, on those type of players and going through what they went through in Boston and now becoming big league managers. Well, I think the experience of being in Boston is uh, priceless for David Price. David Price. <laughs> He's got David Price on his mind. Let's uh, move on. <laughs> David Roberts. <laughs> but, but the analytics is involved here. Yeah. You know, uh, just being around it. I mean, you've got to blend both of them, and so you've got to be with it. You saw Gabe Kapler going with yep. Philly. I mean, it's another Red Sox, totally. ex-Red Sox player. You know, he's full of analytics too. I mean, so you've got to blend the two, but ultimately, is the relationship with the player and the, and the manager. I mean, why those Sox guys? Why are they all becoming managers? What did you, What did you see from those teams? I don't know. I mean, it's kind of strange because yep. you know you wouldn't pick some of these guys if you played with them, <laughs> and it's like Jerry. You never thought Jerry was going to be in the booth right. when I play with Jerry. Right. Seriously? No, I know. You know, so you never know what, what they're thinking. But with Alex Cora, everybody was saying, you're going to be the manager, right? Yeah. So some guys are, are destined for that. All right, so uh, when you look forward with this team, if I said to you, you could do this. You could sign Stanton, but you'd have to give up a Benintendi and company. You could sign J J J J.D. Martinez for $200 million. Or you could go out and acquire guys through trades and what have you. What would you do if you were Dave Dombrowski? Well, I think the simple thing is to write a check, yeah. right? It, it, like they did... With price, right? You need, a, you need an ace, bang, you give him 220 million. I don't like the price tag with J.D. Right. Martinez because his, his agent is Boros, right? So he wants 200 million. I don't want to give him 200 million. Right. I mean, that's, that's tough to do. But at the same time, you can't get Stanton. You'd have to give up you know, a couple of your young players. I don't think, and then well, if he's got $300 million in the next 10 years. I want J.D. Martinez. I do. The problem we have is, is, is uh, Hanley Ramirez. You know? What are we going to do with him? You know, I mean, that's a problem. I think that was a problem last year, to be honest with you. If he had played first base, it would have solved a lot of problems, yep. you know. But he's got 22 beans coming at him. So what are we going to do? We're not going to eat that. So my, my, my answer to that, I want J.D. Martinez. Now, whether or not that happens, I don't know. Lastly, fans would say there's no power in that young core. Yeah. Does that concern you? Does that worry you? Yeah, it does. It does. I, d I would have said, you know, when we were scoring runs and we get eight or nine and everybody's moving the line, right, all that crap, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. you got to have some thump, you know, and the way the game's going, I mean, look at it. Everybody's going, to, you can't be the last in the, in the American League in home runs and you play in Fenway Park, the Boston Red Sox. You know, that, that, that's just not going to happen. And I think there's guys that will hit more home runs, but you've got to bring somebody in that's going to hit 35 home runs. Well, that's what we'll see. Yeah. Eck, uh, yeah, think of us when you're on the golf course tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I look forward to it, and I love coming here. I hadn't been in here in a while, but uh, congratulations to the recipients of the awards. I mean, I, I know you've been here for so long, Bruce, and yeah. congratulations. Bruce to had you. dinner at the Last Supper, so he's been <laughs> here quite long, <laughs> long time. And Pam, congratulations. Yes. Pam, you have been here like, you look like 29 just from the day I met you. <laughs> Bruce, you can go to hell. Pam, you're beautiful, <laughs> right? That's the way to do it, right? So right, thank yeah, you. But thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Enjoy. <laughs>